Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it, and if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Bend. My name is Debbie Boone, and I am your host. Uh, I want to welcome to our platform uh, Dr. Carolyn Brookfield. Now, Carolyn has a really unique skill set. She is a veterinarian. She is a author. She is an entrepreneur, and she is a stand-up comic. Now, that's quite a combination of skills, but her goal is to help leaders, executives, uh, and unapologetic left-brainers rediscover their unique style of everyday creativity to build confidence and uncertainty, better well-being, and boost job performance and satisfaction. Um, I love the fact that she wrote a book, and I'm going to show it to you, called The Reluctant Creative. I can get it into the camera. Well, it's doing weird things. Um, let's do that. Okay, there we go. Uh, and she confesses that she can't sing happy birthday or draw stick people, but she still wrote a book about being creative, which I absolutely love. Um, so, Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us today on The Bend, and I can't wait to share some stories with our audience from your um, kind of bent life, I guess. <laughs> thank you, Debbie. I love it. Call it as you see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the bends are the fun part, right? I mean, sometimes we don't think they're too much fun when we're in them, but Often looking back on them, there's some of the best things that ever happened to us. And that's sort of the premise of this entire vodcast is to talk about some of those bends in life. So let's talk a little bit about how you got started. What was your goal in life and how did you get into veterinary medicine? Yeah, well, uh, I'm a Gen Xer. And when I was growing up, it was like, what do you like to do and what flavor of professional are you going to be? So, you know, it wasn't a lot of options. Um, so I'd always loved animals. So it was, I was going to be a veterinarian and that was a very clear focus and goal of mine. I remember I grew up in a town called Guelph, which is where the Ontario veterinary college is the only vet college in Ontario. And so I grew up with all of these vet students around the town wearing their vet school jackets. And I remember panicking at 14 years old because I didn't have any that experience yet because I knew, you know, I was, I was so focused on it. So fast forward, I got to high school and then I was still on track to be a vet, but I started developing a love of performance and acting and photography. And I remember at one point thinking like, maybe I should be an actor. And I thought I didn't want to live in a basement apartment all my life. Cause I didn't think I had <laughs> the talent. Um, and I thought, what about a cinematographer? But I had no idea how to even start. And I don't think it even occurred to me to go ask my guidance counselor. Like this is pre-internet, right? <laughs> you know, I just kept on my track of, of becoming a vet, which has been a great career for me. I still practice as a vet and love it very much, but I always felt like there was something missing. And, you know, when you talk about the bend, I've had many bends in my vet career. And I think I was kind of looking for something and I wasn't sure what that was, whether it was escaping clients or better salary, you know, the list goes on that we both know. Mm -hmm. And when I started re-engaging my creativity through building some businesses and uh, doing stand-up comedy, some improv and acting classes, I realized that I felt like I had to choose art or science when I was in high school. And I, I felt like this crossroads. And then I realized you don't have to choose. You can do whatever you want. And nobody really cares that much about what you do anyway. So, so that's kind of the, the, the plan there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I love that, that nobody really cares. I think we spent a, an inordinate amount of time thinking about what people are thinking of us. And the honest truth is they're not thinking about us at all. People are self-motivated <laughs> and they're self-seeking and they look after themselves and they really don't spend a great deal of time thinking about us. And, and we worry about it way too much. 
And I think the older we get, the more wisdom comes with that. And we just get to the point where we don't care what other people are thinking as long as we enjoy what we're doing. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, about some of the curveballs, because you said that even in your veterinary career, you had had some curveballs thrown at you. What um, what are some of the things that, you know, you looking back now at life going, wow, that changed the path that made me go into a different direction. Yeah, I think the first one that comes to mind was uh, in vet school, I wanted to be a zoo vet. And I went to every zoo vet conference every year. And I did all of my external electives. I was in something related to zoo and wildlife. And I remember being at the White Oak Plantation, which is a world-class, amazing destination as an extern. And I remember talking to the resident who was there at the time and, and they were looking for a job. And I said, oh, where, where are the jobs? And they said, well, there's only two jobs. One is in Oklahoma, one's in like, you know, wherever it was. And then I'm like, oh, what kind of salary is it? And then I was like, maybe I don't want to be a zoo <laughs> Exactly. You know, because I, I value my independence and and being, I didn't want my career to define where I lived or what I did. And so that was one big transition was I had dedicated myself to full on being zoo wildlife. And what I did instead was went into small animal practice, but I also worked for like 10 years doing wildlife rehabilitation. So I was able to kind of find a way to, I was a creative way to make that love of, of, um, alternative species work. So that would have been the first curveball. Um, and it was funny because when I was in school, I was like, I'm so done with school. Like, I don't want to do another internship, m- multiple internships, residencies, like four to six more years minimum. And I don't regret my decision yet. When I turned around and I had colleagues that were also interested in being zoo vets, all of a sudden they were board certified zoo vets. And I thought, oh, that wasn't that long. It didn't seem that long mm-hmm. in hindsight. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that was probably one of the big curveballs. Yeah. You know, it's amazing to me how many uh, in young students, I mean, I've talked to some, several of the VBMAs at the colleges and uh, in talking to these young kids, 101 is like, oh, I want to be a zoo veterinarian. I went, you know, there's like four jobs on earth for that and nobody wants to give them up. So I really, what is your second plan? And many of them will go into mixed animal practice because they like the variety. And I think you're you know, ability to, to find an alternate path with uh, wildlife rehab is, is certainly a good way to manage, you know, doing what you, your intention was and still have kind of a normal, as normal as veterinary medicine gets, right? It's normal as vet meds gets. So looking at that and looking back at life, what has been your toughest challenge? Oh, that's a hard question. I mean, vet school was pretty hard. Mm. Um, after I finished vet school, so I had done that externship, I mentioned a white oak plantation, which is North Florida and long story, but I had some friends down there and I thought I'm going to move to Florida. It'll be like Canada, only warmer because I'm from Canada. It was not like Canada, only in the warmer. (laughs) I was 24 new grad moved countries, you know, had no money. And, um, that was tough in some ways, but it was also an exciting adventure in other ways. So, you know, when we talk about something that's a challenge, I think I love, like many people in this profession, I rise to a challenge and I love a challenge. Mm-hmm. So, so how did you read the question? What was the hardest thing? What or was the hardest, the toughest life challenge? Toughest, oh, having kids. Oh, <laughs> I don't have any. I, I look back. And I saw that my mother says, why didn't you ever want any kids? And I said, I grew up in the restaurant business Mm -hmm. and my parents owned these restaurants. And so from the time I was 12, I was cleaning up after other people's kids. And I said, I think I've cleaned up after enough kids in my life and I'm not doing it anymore. And so (laughs) never changed my mind about having kids. (laughs) It was too much work for me. It's a lot of work. That is very true. As far as other people's children, because they have godchildren who I love, but but it's nice to what? borrow them and send them out. You say I've heard that um, like it's a t-shirt that says, if I'd known how great it was to be a grandma, I would have done it first. It would, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we talk about uh, fear and you talk about this in your book. And I really, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that fear holds us back from so many great things because we build it up in our mind as reality. And one of my very favorite quotes is from Will Smith, which is <laughs> right now, although I don't know if I want to quote this or not, but truthfully, he was in a movie and it was called uh, Independence Day. And he said, fear is not real. Danger is real. 
And we need in our brain to determine which ones which and, and to act accordingly. So I would love to talk to you a little bit about fear. And honestly, getting up on stage as a stand-up comic, I think would have to be one of those fear-inducing situations. But it, no more than taking that scalpel and making that first midline incision into a dog. So I think in a lot of our stuff in life, we, we do things that should induce fear, but we move through them. So let's, how, how do you move through fear? Yeah, that, I love that quote. That's great because another, another, I can't remember who um, said this quote. It wasn't a quote, but something to do with like fear is very self-centering. Like if you're fearful, you're not thinking about others. You're thinking about yourself, mm -hmm. which I thought was an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. And when you look at fear, I mean, we are, we feel rejection, like physical pain, mm -hmm. like in our brains. So if we are in a situation where we're going to feel like we're going to be excluded from our group, from an evolutionary perspective, we are wired to avoid that at all costs, but it's an outdated operating system. So I have an inner critic. Everybody has one. Mine's called Todd. You know, I, I, <laughs> I love the fact that you named him. I don't know why. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I've heard other people since then say that that's a good strategy. I'm like, well, it works for me. So I'm like, it's okay, Todd, like no one's going to kill me. I'm not going to die if nobody laughs at my jokes. Like, so I think a lot of it is, um, first of all, self-awareness about what is driving the fear. Like, is this a fear because it's an instinctive reaction that's left over from when we had dial up internet in caves somewhere yeah. or is this like a true danger that i should be reacting to mm -hmm. and i think what i tend to do and it used to be unconscious when i you know i traveled the, the world for 14 months solo and you know rock climbing and things like that i i'm a bit of a risk seeker thanks to my adhd but also it's this sense of what's the worst that's going to happen so what's the worst it's risk mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like if you're doing a surgery and you're out of your depth, like what's the worst that could happen? Well, maybe it could be really bad. Mm -hmm. What's the likelihood of that happening? What's the evidence in my past that's going to make me think I, I'm going to, I'm going to botch the surgery. Like I've done many surgeries or I've been trained appropriately, or I have backup if I need it, you know, it's, it's all about like this emotional reaction, um, and there's a very famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't know if you've heard of that one. I've read it. Kahneman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he talks about the slow and fast thinking brain, mm -hmm. right? So we all think we're using our slow thinking brain, which yeah. is the rational thought, but we're actually re reacting emotionally and justifying it with our thinking brain. Yeah. Even those of you who think that you're complete logical thinkers. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. so I think going back to that, I think the trick is seeing that reaction for what it is, an emotion and instinct, and then using our thinking brain to say, okay, what is the evidence? You know, what's the worst that could happen? How can I approach this? Everybody feels that fear the people who seem fearless still feel that fear they just practice stepping into it and knowing that the worst doesn't usually happen yeah yeah I you know that that's just it I mean I think you know I'm a speaker and you're a speaker and I've had so many people come up to me oh my god I could never do what you do and I went well sure you can because all it takes is overcoming that fear and believe me the first time I stood at a podium I thought I was going to pass out I was hanging on to the sides for dear life and my knuckles were white I was taking deep breaths and I thought if you've practiced this 500 times you've got it and then once you start everything is okay but you know I've done thousands and thousands of talks now and I love it I love getting up in front of people um, and I think that that's all that it really takes is a lot of practice and a lot of self-talk. When I'm speaking with veterinarians and technicians about this stuff, I said, look, you're trained diagnosticians. You're trained to figure out and problem solve. So use this skill in problem solving this fearful reaction that you're having, um, especially when it comes to clients uh, attacking you. A lot of times that attacking we want to justify, we want to argue back. When the logic says, this is the equivalent of a fractious cat. There's no <laughs> logic with a fractious cat. Yeah. You gotta let it calm down before you try to do anything. And this is the same thing with the fractious human. Just, you gotta let it ride. Uh, and, and we don't want to do that. We want to justify, negotiate, and be right more than anything else in the world. So yeah, we, we have the skill set in veterinary medicine, we have the skill set. Should we should have skill set in life? 
And I think the older you get, the better you get at it because you gain that emotional intelligence. Yeah. And I think that that's an interesting point. What you raise a lot about is this, this drive for people to seek certainty, which is another evolutionary drive. Like Mm -hmm. we are geared to find certainty. And if we feel uncertain, whether we've got the fractious cat, the difficult client or the surgery we're approaching, if we feel uncertain, we are again, predisposed and instinctively drawn to status quo solutions, which is great if we're a mouse trying to run away from a cat because what's worked for thousands of generations will probably work. Not so great if you're, you know, dealing with a client on telehealth or something, which we have no framework that fits with that. Mm -hmm. And that's what creativity is so great with, because anytime you do anything creative, whether it's um, a new way to connect with a client or something artistic, which can be, which is creative, um, but not all creativity is artistic is you're stepping into that uncertainty and facing the possibility of failure and having the courage to proceed anyway and realize even if it's not okay like you at that podium it's okay oh yeah (laughs) yeah I remember seeing this one time and I thought it was so it was so true and so telling your audience wants you to succeed because they want to be entertained. They want to learn something from you. Otherwise, they wouldn't waste their time and be there. So you have a whole group of people who are actually rooting for you to succeed there. And instead of thinking, oh my God, they're up here picking apart what I am speaking about. And and I'm not going to tell you there's not going to be one or two of those because you, I'm sure, have an occasional heckler in the crowd. And I have certainly had presentations where we give the after survey and 50 people go, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever learned. It's wonderful. You're a great speaker. I can't wait to hear you again. And then there's that one. And you go, were you in the same room with all these other people? Like what, where were you coming from? But I think that you, you know, again, it's, and and that's the one you dwell on, right? That's the one you go, oh, what did I do wrong? Why did I reach that person? But I think after doing like really hundreds and hundreds of these, I've come to the conclusion that certainly I can learn from that feedback but I can't be destroyed by it because I have to realize that sometimes people come to classes like that and they want to prove themselves better than the instructor. Uh, So there's the one up ones. There's the other ones who are there by duress. (laughs) They don't want to come anyway. Their boss made them come. And so they're sitting there reluctantly. And unless you're really good, you know, it's going to be hard to overcome that. They're looking for it. Yeah, they are. So, you know, I think they've got to be in the right headspace to want to learn. And then I've got to be in the right headspace to put the best out there to teach. And sometimes that's not happening in one direction or the other. So you just, you know, maybe you didn't reach them somehow um, or you said one thing that put them off. And I think with a comedian, I think you could do that certainly easy. I mean, I don't even want to talk about the Chris Rock, Will Smith thing, (laughs) but but really, I mean, that was a fairly simple thing that said, ooh, you know, it struck a lot of people funny and then it struck the wrong one, not. And there we go. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the trick with comedy and censorship. And I think your point about the criticism is a valid one and it goes back to the practice and that's the practice of getting criticism makes you more resilient to criticism. I mean, Justin Bieber, Madonna, I don't know, people who are often like teased mercilessly in the media, they didn't start with a thick skin, you know, and I don't know, maybe it's still really, I'm sure it does maybe it bothers them. But when you get more criticism, you realize that if you're going to do anything of significance, you're going to get criticism. And that's the price you pay for standing out and speaking out Mm -hmm. and realizing that nobody cares that much about you anyway. If you get harsh criticism, which I have as well, I've had criticism that's made me cry. And um, realizing that a lot of times, like you said, it's a lot more about them Mm -hmm. and trying to focus on on the positive and trying to take a deep breath and remove that emotion and just looking at the criticism saying, is there anything valuable I can take from this? Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is often there isn't, you know, like you go, you know, I used to give technical presentations for an industry and I would try to make them as fun and interesting as possible, but that really offended some hardcore academics because I wasn't, I didn't look like the (laughs) academic, you know, and Mm -hmm. when I look at my presentation, I was quoting peer reviewed articles and using data and science, but because I didn't present it in the way that they expected it, it threatened them and it was outside of their normal and it caused uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, you should be 
like this. You should be like everybody else. And that's what's wrong with this world is we all sit in these boxes because everybody else is in a box and we're all looking around waiting for someone else to make a move. And really it's your job to make that move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 If if you're going to have an opinion, if you're going to be a change maker in this world, you're going to piss somebody off and, you know, and you have to go into it knowing that's okay. And I can guarantee you there's people who probably have been uncomfortable by some of the things that they have, I have said to them because I'd really do. I struggle with academics a lot. Um, I think that they live in a world that is so isolated from reality um, and make these judgments on people who are out here doing the work in the trenches that they set a lot of young veterinarians up for failure right at the beginning. And until we change that model, there's a lot of harm that we do setting these uh, unrealistic expectations. And, and some of it is just a, a lot of young veterinarians, I think, have an unrealistic expectation of what the work really is. And I think that's another thing that we really need to work on in veterinary medicine is illuminating people to how it is every day working in a small animal practice or a mixed animal practice or a feedlot practice. And then, then you decide, you know, what's going on. Um, somebody, I was having this conversation and we were talking about in human health, they actually started having people do clinical rotations year one mm-hmm. rather than year four, because now you're like, oh, do I want to invest three more years of my life and a whole lot of money in doing something that I just hate. This is not what I thought it was going to be. And I think that's really a good model. It it has surprised me in interviewing young veterinarians, how many of them really didn't work in practice. Like you were talking about, I need to get into practice. I am 14 years old. I haven't worked in a practice yet, but that's the reality check. You know, does it really track with what I think I'm going to be doing the rest of my life? And if not, I need to bail out now, not $200,000 later. Um, so it's, there's a, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we need to make a movie like the, the real day in the life. This is not Nat Geo TV. This is the real day in the life of a veterinarian. And here's yeah. what's going to happen when the anal glands get sprayed in your head and you go home with poop in your pocket, right? <laughs> that's, yes. real. that's the real part of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the vet school in my town, they do, um, they are, I don't know if they do clinical rotations from year one, but they do communication training from year one. So the first years who know nothing, they have actors that come in and they've got like exam rooms set up and they've got a coach and then people, the other students watch through like a one-way glass, which I think is fantastic oh, yeah. because I think, it, you know, it's, it's like you said, one more step because I think that what really traps, trips a lot of young veterinarians up is this, and maybe this is coming from the academic side that you were talking about, who are often rigid perfectionist, um, insecure themselves. So they have to work in academia where it's structured and there's less ambiguity. And now you have a young veterinarian that's out and they're so worried about what everybody's going to think because they've heard these judging comments. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's how do you practice perfection? You can't. And how do you get rid of that? What we alluded to before that fear of judgment Mm -hmm. where, you know, I think a lot of vets are not worried so much about the client. I mean, they are with the reviews and things they're worried about being judged by other veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And so I think that judgment is a a very toxic and very, very insidious thing. And, you know, I've spoken to a vet and I kind of blurted out, they were talking, we were talking about a case. It was a clinic I was working at. And this other vet said something about like, oh, why didn't they do this? And I just blurted out, don't be that vet. Mm-mm. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was a little blunt. I can be blunt. But I was just like, no, you know, don't go there because right. you know, we need to give each other some care and some grace for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about giving others grace because you don't know what the client allowed, you know, and, and believe me, I ran emergency and especially hospital and we would get some records in and you go, oh, I mean, I'm not a veterinarian. I would just look at these things and go, geez, Louise, this is pretty pitiful. But then again, you don't know what they were working with. The client might have come in and that's one of those, I've got $20 and here's, we're going to just do the best that we can um, with what we've got to work with. And sometimes that is exactly what is happening. And then again, we don't know what we don't know. So we tend to do, you know, what we're familiar with. And then, you know, a specialist comes in or somebody else who has 
advanced training and that picked that up. And to me, then it looks obvious. You know, I go in as a consultant with some of the business stuff. And to me, it looks so obvious. Why can't you get out of your own head and see that this is, you know, a simple fix? But you can't because you've always done it that way. And that's just the way you think it has to be done. Um, or, you, I, or you go down a rabbit hole, right? Like in the yeah. ER case, maybe that vet's been working 14 hours and they've got six critical cases and this mm-hmm. other one is, is, needs to be addressed, but you know, you've just used up all your mental cognitive ability and you mm-hmm. just kind of start rolling this thing down the hill. And sometimes it's the wrong way. And if you mm-hmm. don't have a great team and support system where you're overworked or mm-hmm. haven't slept, you know, it's, it's setting people up for failure for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, and going back again to, you know, setting boundaries and having breaks and doing what you need to do. Uh, My sister-in-law is a plastic surgeon. And I remember talking to her when she was going through her residency and she would be three straight days on. And I'm like, I don't want you operating on me if you've been up three straight days. I mean, just no way. Well, when I, when I worked, yeah, when I worked in Florida and I don't know if it's still this way, um, I worked in ER and I would work, we were only open when the other clinics were closed. So Mm -hmm. we would transfer things back to the regular vet. This is like 97, 98. And I would come on at 5 PM and work until nine the next day. And they had like a bed with a microwave, like to nap. Mm -hmm. And I did that Monday to Thursday. Then Friday I came in at five and I worked until Monday morning at eight. Mm -hmm. There were times I was doing a GDV surgery at 3 AM on a Monday and I'd had like three, four hours sleep mm-hmm. since the Friday. Mm-hmm. And I probably shouldn't have been doing surgery on those cases. Yeah, I mean, you're just running on adrenaline at that point and hoping that it, you know, all the, the, the automation in your brain kicks in at that point in time, because, and you, you know, and honestly, it usually does, but still there's exhaustion and decision-making. And if something had happened that you needed that quick decision-making skill set your brain would have been exhausted and you would have probably struggled. And you're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. a little difficult. So I, this, I always think this is a fun question. What do you consider to be your biggest career mistake? I don't know. I, you know, I'm a big fan of Dan Pink's and he just came out with a book called the power of regret. And he was doing research for that. And he actually gave a blurb for my book, which was fantastic. He's an amazing human being. And he says that there are regrets and regrets are good. And I was always of the position, I don't have regrets. Um, but in his book, he talks about the, the at least though, like but people will have regrets, but they'll say, but at least I. And so I think my biggest career mistake was I took a job at the zoo here in Calgary through the conservation research program. And it was like an office job, but it was looking at wildlife rehabilitation data and writing a book and a guide for rehabilitators on like to help them decide decision-making on whether to treat an animal or not what's the likelihood of release it was a massive massive pay cut and I said that's okay it's work that I love and I enjoyed the work and I don't regret it but that pay cut was did significantly impact our quality of life I got married that year and you know I said I don't care about the money but it did affect me so I don't know that it's a mistake but it was something that I went into and and decided it was only a six-month contract so it wasn't forever but I was like oh that was significant did significantly affect my quality of life yeah you know I I talked to a lot of vet students and they are oh I have to go out and I have to get my um to try to find an externship and or an internship or a residency doing this this and I said okay but I, I want you to understand that that's going to where you are as far as pay for the rest of your life, because every year our pay is based on the pay that we have this year mm-hmm. and it builds up and builds up. And if you lose a year making $20,000 a year or $25,000 a year working 80 hour work weeks, basically that's slave wages. That's not appropriate. And that's one of the things we really do need to fix. That is so um, devastating to the future economy of veterinary medicine. I mean, we, you know, we come out with a lot of student loan debt, students do, and then to be hamstrung that first year out and then have to almost start at level one when you walk out. Um, And yeah, I know the goal is to you know, be a specialist or, I mean, if, but if you're not going to be a specialist, you don't need to do that. You just need to find a good mentor hospital that will guide you. And then, you know, you can, you can make money in veterinary medicine. I know I've seen it done and I know that it's, you know, it's, you can be successful in this career, 
Um, so I, I struggle with a lot of things. And, you know, the older I get, the more I look back at stuff and go, geez, Louise, this is, this needs to be fixed. This needs to be fixed. And this needs to be fixed. So well, it's, have, a culture have, of, it's a culture of trying to eliminate that ambiguity, right? So for a student that maybe doesn't feel ready after their vet school is finished. And now if we have a culture of people saying you have to be this perfect or level specialist level medicine to practice, then that person feels that their only option is an internship because they're like, well, if I'm not confident in my abilities, clearly I need more training. Yeah. Whereas it's really an internal process they have to work on mm -hmm. versus external qualifications and, yeah. and more and information. Because, you know, they're not going to be confident when they get out from that either. Because there's always, you've got to finally step into the job. You, you've got to jump off of the bridge, so to speak, into the water. Um, the diving board happens, right? One day, if you're going to dive, you got to jump off the board and get into the pool. So there's always that the imposter syndrome runs rampant. And, and I'm not saying I haven't had it. I, uh, I've been asked to be the keynote speaker for three large conferences this year in the United States. And I'm like, oh man. And then I'm like, oh man, <laughs> you know, I, gotta, I gotta really bring it. Like I gotta, I've been thinking about, I got a year to think about this. So I really have to work hard to, to make it right. But I, you know, I, I do think I have confidence that I can do it, but am I going to be nervous and scared when I step on the stage? Oh my God. Yeah, I am. I am. Cause it's just going to be a, a big deal probably to me more than anybody else, you know, because everybody else is like, oh, we're fine. You know, we're going to, how much more time do we have to sit here before we go to, to a lecture on parasites or something? <laughs> Well, that's where the courage comes from is like you're saying people see you on that stage and they think that you're fearless that you feel the fear you just do it anyway mm -hmm. and i think that's where um i find this real common bridge between um the, the creativity and science and the practice of veterinary medicine is this sense of we lose our creativity we we don't have the time for it like i felt like i had to choose art or science mm -hmm. but when you're doing something creative, you're stepping off that diving board every single time, but it doesn't matter because if your painting is terrible or your cake doesn't work out or your garden doesn't grow, nobody's going to die. Yeah. So it's that repeated feeling of stepping off the diving board. And if you never step off the diving board, which is a great analogy, then you never will step off the diving board. So you have to start with like the kiddie pool mm -hmm. and then you have to start with a diving board and then work your way up and just practice, 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 because we can never eliminate ambiguity. And there's a lot of research around tolerance of ambiguity in physicians. There's actually a study about tolerance of ambiguity in veterinarians versus physicians. And they expected that the vets would be more tolerant of ambiguity, I think, because we see such a diversity of cases and species, but actually it wasn't. It was the physicians that had a higher tolerance of ambiguity. And with a higher tolerance of ambiguity, you have better mental health. You have more confidence in facing uncertainty. You do less Overdiagnosis, which is like every single test under the book, and you get some spurious result that you start chasing rather than saying, Okay, I have enough information to move forward now, and I can't eliminate all of the potential ambiguity. Yeah. So I think that tolerance of ambiguity and creativity is a huge piece. Like in research shows that if you have higher tolerance of ambiguity, you're high, more creative and you also have higher resilience. Yes. So they're deeply, deeply interconnected. They are. They are. I want to share this page for your book because I, I love this page. This is, I can't show it very well, but this is like some things that push you out of your comfort zone that you should try to do. So it has that you should sing in the shower. You should write a short story, sketch a picture of yourself, play an instrument or bake some bread. Now of all those things, I have done all those things. And I will tell you uh, the worst disaster I ever had in the kitchen had to do with trying to make a pie. Oh. <laughs> my, uh, my pie crust ended up in multiple pieces the size of dimes and I just kind of pasted them and plastered them into the bottom of the pie pan. And then once it was done, of course, everything just completely fell apart. And it was my first and last pie. And it's been over 40 years. So I've, I've decided that I'm better off singing in the shower, <laughs> working on playing an instrument and, and art than any of that stuff. But I, I, you know, I've always looked back and when I read this book, it really hit me because I've always had like a side gig yeah. and the side gigs were always something creative. I used to sew, uh, I used to paint portraits of animals and children for my clients. Um, I used to do needlework and, you know, anything that had to do with 
using the other side of my brain because I spent all day crunching numbers, running reports, doing business stuff. And this was just, you know, a, an hour or two spent every night with a paintbrush in the garage. And you don't have to be good. You just have to kind of let your mind go into that. And it's such a nice off switch. Yeah. And I think we're, we are wired to do that. And whether it's something creatively artistic, you know, I, I am not an artistic person really. Um, but I like to make, um, memes. I like to, you know, do weird things with my photographs and make them look like paintings. I like to garden, you know, the, uh, choosing an outfit. Those are all creative things. You don't have to, I mean, that's a great way to do it is painting and needlework, but you don't have to do any of those things to use your creativity. In fact, I would challenge everybody who's watching this that you are already doing something that's creative. You're just not calling it that because it's not artistic. Mm -hmm. And what you alluded, what you mentioned there um, is so important. Even if you're bad at something, you still get the mental health benefits. So there's tons of research. I could flip through like at least 20 papers that talk about every everyday creativity, like making a meal, increasing your positive effect the next day, or um, having a better mental health because you're doing something creative like knitting or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, and, and the reason we like creativity, the reason we get joy out of expressing ourselves creatively is because we use our problem solving skills, which is really what makes us so human, right? Yeah. And you know, for me, my husband says, when are you going to retire? I went, I'm not going to retire for like five years because I love what I do because for me, it is like putting puzzles together. When I go into an animal hospital and I see things that need work or they have you know, challenges that they want me to help them solve, all that creativity, you know, right and left brain work together. And you know, it's really funny. I'm sitting here at this moment with my arms crossed like this. And I don't know <laughs> if you know this or not. You probably do. But if you do this, you are engaging both sides of your brain and it really helps you problem solve. So if you're stuck on a case or if you're you know trying to figure out something just cross your arms and touch both sides of your shoulders and get both sides of your crosswire brains going together <laughs> and and start solving those problems because that's fun instead of looking at it as you know oh my god I have to be perfect look at it as wow this is like a really cool puzzle mm -hmm. that I can fit I can solve you know let me work on the puzzle now the funny thing is I I hate crossword puzzles I don't do wordle I don't need anything like that because for me that's like I that wastes my time and I'm I'm one of those those people right don't waste my time but I will solve something you know if my garden is not doing right I'm like hmm I gotta do the research figure out how to make the plants grow right and that's so much fun. So I think if we kind of change the way we look at challenges is like, oh, I dread these things as to, hmm, this is fun problem solving. Mm -hmm. Then that other part of your brain kind of gets engaged and we get to, we get to make it fun, even though it's work. Yeah. And I think also applying a, a process to it, maybe not like if your garden's not doing well, but even in that case. So I'm trained with the creative problem solving approach, which is like design thinking. A lot of people mm -hmm. kind of similar mm -hmm. and there's a very specific process to go through. And I think a lot of people think that uh, problem solving is about ideating, right? Which is one part of it. But the first part is like Einstein said, if I had 60 minutes to solve a problem, I'd spend 59 minutes making sure I was solving the right problem, right? So the first step is actually clarifying the problem. Then there's ideate, but then there's also develop and implement. And I think what people do is they get stuck in this problem solving in the ideate mode. And they think, well, what are these ideas? Like none of them will ever work. That's one part of the process. So yes, to, to create a problem solved solution, you need to go through all of the steps and at the end with the timeline and deliverables. And I think people often get stuck in this ideate mode because it's more fun mm -hmm. for many people. I'm an ideator and, you know, they can go with personality as well. Some people are more like more clarifiers. Some people are more implementers, but I think it's also knowing that when we approach a problem, yes, there's lots of things we can do to try to get the juices flowing. You know, the big thing is diverging um, and converging separately, which is like thinking of great ideas and then picking an idea. Like we tend to do that all at the same time, which is a killer for creative thinking, but then also making sure that we're not just shooting out ideas and that's not creative problem solving. Creative problem solving can involve a framework that helps you come to a really good solution. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's also important to know is like that there's so many different pieces to it. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a really cool exercise that's going to happen here. It's called veterinary visionaries. 
And I would love to send you the link and invite you to this because you're the perfect person to, to get involved in this. But it's an idea board. And the idea is to bring all where there's 50 associations involved in it and individuals that you know are interested in doing this. But you come into underneath this umbrella and it's an idea board and everybody puts their ideas up and then you can collaborate with these ideas. You can comment on these ideas. You can upvote the ideas. If we're going to solve the problems of veterinary medicine, we need to use all the brilliance that we have in our community to solve the problem or to start you know, with working with active solutions. And we have a lot of people working in silos, but if we can collaborate, the odds of us succeeding are much greater. So this veterinary visionaries is going to start May the 1st through mm -hmm. the 27th. You know, I encourage anybody who's listening to this to it, it, submit an idea. I mean, there's a $2,000 grand prize too. So there's always the, the, the carrot at the end of the stick. The, the question is, how do we have a sustainable improvement of the well-being in veterinary medicine that could be systemic throughout our profession rather than just here's, you know, this idea, this idea, and this idea. We need, we need a root problem solved, not it's kind of like this, you know, we, we're putting a lot of band-aids on wounds. Yeah. Why do we keep cutting ourselves? What, yeah. That's where we start. You know, that's, we, we well, got to really delve into it. Yeah. It sounds like a fantastic program. I think I'm excited to check it out. Mm -hmm. I think what comes to mind there is number one is, is some, like, is it facilitated? Is there someone taking people through this idea of what is the problem? Because maybe the problem isn't well-being. Like, for example, I see so many people saying, you know, you see Facebook posts or whatever about like clients need to know that we're all taking our own lives and that, you know, it's terrible and you all need to be nicer to us. Mm -hmm. So in their mind, the problem is clients don't know how to treat veterinarians, mm -hmm. but maybe that's not what the problem is. Maybe the problem is we don't know how to enforce boundaries and develop the emotional fortitude and the communication skills. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't get to that point. So mm -hmm. that's where I really think that, um, and Far be it for me, I love to jump in and ideate all day long, but I think like this clarifying the problem and taking it through a specific, and it has to be set up, you know, I think it sounds like a great start and I don't know how, how it's, it's planned, but one of the tricks, like when you're doing creative problem solving facilitation is making sure you're setting up the environment so that everybody has the ground rules and that we know, are we diverging? Are we converging? What are we trying to achieve with this? And I think that, um, you know, it can be easy just to jump into the ideate mode, which has a lot of benefits. But if we want true tangible change, we need to make sure that we're doing a process where we're coming out with some outcomes and some solutions to what the specific problem is that we're trying to solve. Like maybe your garden's not growing. You're like, I need to, th I need to plant more seeds. Well, no, that's not actually the problem. Like you've already jumped from like problem to solution before you've even said, well, well, what do I really want? I want more fresh vegetables. And maybe it's not anything to do in the end with your garden. Maybe you chuck your garden in the bin and you just decide you're going to go to like a farming co-op and they're going to deliver your produce, right? So I think that <laughs> yeah. we, we're so, as humans, we're so bad. Like kindergartens are great. They're clueless, right? That's what makes them so creative. They don't have any paragraph. Like as humans, we make shortcuts and rubrics to help make sense of the world. And sometimes we cannot get away from that, which limits our ability to come up with creative solutions. And it's not that we're not trying, it's just that we have too much experience sometimes. And that's where having different stakeholders, different um, diversity, uh, you know, whether it's demographic or ethnic or different professions, like novelty and diversity fuels creativity and helps build like a truly innovative solution versus mostly it's only usually what we get is subpar improvements over what we're already doing. Yeah. So that's yeah. my soapbox about creativity. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I love, I love it because it's true. We, we, uh, we will shut ideas down before we even test drive them. And yeah. it's, the, it's this fear of failure, right? We can't fail because then we will be judged. And sometimes you just have to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it and we'll see if it works. And if it doesn't work, maybe part of it works mm -hmm. and let's try Let's keep that part going and let's see if we can fix this, the second part. But I, I found a lot of times with managers and practice owners, particularly, they think they have to solve everything and they kind of they keep themselves in their little world and they say, and they dictate from on high, this is how we will solve this problem. 
And when I do consultations, I go and I interview the entire staff and I go, what do you think is wrong here? And what do you think needs to be done to fix this? And I'll fi always find a common thread through all of it. And a lot of it is that nobody has talked to the people who are actually doing the work to try to solve the problem. There's somebody who's standing outside going, well, this is how we need to solve this problem. And so I think the point that you made about setting boundaries, mm -hmm. I've taught many, many, many years and uh, to all team members. And I said, the thing is we have to train our clients and you train clients to be good clients and you train clients to be bad clients. And when we allow clients to keep us late after work, to make us work through our lunch, to give them our personal cell phone and have them call us all hours of the day and night, because they will, mm -hmm. then you have set in appropriate boundaries and your life is miserable, but, but you let it happen. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and when I started consulting, I was shocked to go into practices where people didn't go to lunch because in my hospital, you went to lunch. It was a scheduled thing, one hour every day, no matter what was going on, you went to lunch because we lived in a controlled environment where mm -hmm. people were not allowed to run amok, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. including the clients. Um, yeah. And so it just astounded me that people were, were killing themselves at work all because they were afraid to say no. Right. To people. It's a culture. There's two things to that, I think. I think one is you can hold a boundary and hold great compassion for somebody at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very challenging to do. And I feel like I it took me a long time to try to, you know, figure out to start to figure out how to get that right. And the other thing is this culture. So I'll give you an example. I was working somewhere and um, they, if something came back, blood result or whatever, then the, the original vet would call the owner. And I was only filling in, I'm a locum or a, a relief vet. So I was only filling in like once a week, sometimes I wouldn't be for two weeks. I'm like, what do you want to do with my, like, what should we do with my cases? I don't want something to fall through cracks. And, and the, the manager said, well, I, I'll just flag myself a note for the next time I'm in. And we were like, well, that might not work because it's too long. He says, or I just do it from home, but I don't expect you to do that. And I was like, I use this as an example, not because I think that that person's a, a bad manager or anything, but it's just like, this is the culture we live in. Like, it's okay for me to be a workaholic, but I don't expect you to. And I, I'm sure it was a genuine, very mm -hmm. like genuine thing. But if I was younger, I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I have to do that. That's what's right. done here. That's so I think the way we, we need, do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think a leadership by example is so important. You know, like if your leaders are not enforcing boundaries or not setting boundaries for themselves, they're coming in on their days off, giving out their cell phone, then the employees, I don't care what you say. I don't care if you say right. you don't need to do that. They are going to feel guilty, responsible for the most part to do that. So I think that leading by example, like you said, having good boundaries, but also supporting the boundaries of other people mm -hmm. because they might not be the same boundaries as you, mm -hmm. right? So I think it's also just trying to listen, just like we should be doing with clients, like listen to people, try to understand their point of view. And if we don't just try to find a connection and speak about how we can solve the problem versus just this subtext that's always simmering like a toxic stew in the, in the background, right? The us versus them. It's either the front versus the back or the clients versus the team. And the truth of the matter is if we would collaborate, life, life would be better all the way around. And I, I guess, you know, I didn't know any better, uh, I guess, when I started in animal health. And I had always grown up in the hospitality business. So understanding hospitality, making people feel welcome, that's the way I rolled. And that's what I brought into veterinary medicine, which I, you know, I don't think is all that common. Hopefully it's more common now that I've been talking about it for 15 years, but you know, it wasn't. But when that happens and people feel that you appreciate them and that there's genuine care and concern for them and that you're their partner, they trust you. And there is, and life is so much easier when you have that. And, and, you know, it is really difficult with new clients, but over time you build up a trust relationship. And in 10 years, your regular clients going, doc, do whatever you need to do. I'll figure out how to pay for it. When that first client goes, are you really sure you're not trying to rip me off? Because <laughs> well, that's my life. Them, every right? time, it's almost every time I'm a new new person, yeah. dealing with a new person and building that trust is so important. And a lot of people see the relief lifestyle and I think they're like, oh, that sounds great. 
but you're always at that step one mm -hmm. and it's time consuming and it's tricky and yeah and with the team as well like trying to balance that supporting the team and you know trying to figure out everything new and build that trust with everybody is such a key once you have trust everything else is so much easier it is it absolutely is um well we certainly you know kind of got a away from our typical questions <laughs> here <laughs> well, that's not unusual for me at all <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I feel like squirrel, squirrel. That's the way I roll. Uh, but I think this has been just such an interesting conversation. And I really appreciate your, you know, openness about, you know, all this stuff, especially like, I think relief that that's so interesting to me as you're always day one, right? And it had not occurred to me because, well, sometimes relief vets are kind of rotating in on a kind of, kind of regular basis, but I have um, a good friend who owns Relief Rover and Cindy and I've talked about this and it just setting the ground rules and getting the veterinarians on board about what your protocols are and having something actually in writing that they could look at and go, this is how we do it here is extremely helpful when you have relief veterinarians in and you know, just God bless all relief veterinarians right now because we <laughs> need you so desperately in practices because uh, everybody is just shorthanded and struggling trying to find that uh, that new associate um, which just makes it even harder to set up those foundations yeah. like um, I know Cindy you know and she reached out to me because I closed a business very much like relief role I, I had a business called Canada locum for many years and it was it's probably 10 years ahead of its time and I just kind of lost my passion for it so I closed it but yeah, I had a bunch of resources like checklists for people to go through, like, where's your control drug key? Because a lot of times it's a one doctor practice and they go on vacation and you show up and they're like, oh, nobody has the drug key or just like silly things. Like, do you, I, I was doing a relief at a vet, this is many years ago, it's probably 20 years ago now, um, where I turned up and I had a dental and I said, oh, where's your drill? And they're like, we don't have a drill. I don't think that would happen nowadays, but I'm like, you don't have a drill. Like, what do you use to section your teeth? Can you guess, Debbie, what they brought me? I'd be, I'm afraid to guess. Well, giggly wire would have been one, which is probably lesser of evils. They brought me one of those, you know, those red double action wire cutters, like for cutting no. on like a, a cat bolt mouth. cutter, like a yeah. bolt cutter. And I was like, I cannot, like, that's something I should have known before there was an animal asleep on the table. Whoa. Wow. I mean, you know, I will tell you that we did all of you to think that relief vets are like, oh, it's such an easy gig. You wander in and you know, <laughs> like, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, I will tell you that we have bolt cutters in my hospital, but only for orthopedic surgery or yeah. cutting yeah. pins. <laughs> There's a use for them, but not for, yeah, cat but not for cutting teeth. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just picturing this. I would just imagine that it would just fracture and just fall apart. I mean, oh my God, I just, what I did, I think I managed to get it out without sectioning the tooth. It was like yeah. a, a, an abscess tooth. Uh -huh. And I was just like, thank goodness. This wasn't like, I would yeah. have, I would have to woke in the animal up and say, yeah. no. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. I can't manage that. Wow. I can't manage that. Um, so I would, I do want to ask you one question because I think it's really important for people who are looking to do something, you know, different or stretch their career a little bit. And that's about the power of networking. So I connected with you through Dr. Marie Holowacek, who I just think is just wonderful. And she said, oh, you need to talk to my friend. And she wrote this book and she sent me a copy of your book. I know. She's such a, she's such a, she's such an amazing human being. She she's, is. She yeah. is. But, you know, as far as, you know, stage performance and all the other things that you've done, book writing and getting that information out, Tell me a little bit about how networking has helped you. Yeah, that's a good question. So I am a natural networker. I like to reach out and talk to people. What something that I need to get better at is being intentional. So I think since I've, I've you know, I've had two businesses and I'm doing the speaking, I get a lot of people who are like, hey, can we book half an hour to chat? And I'm getting a lot more protective of my time. I'm like, that would be, what, what would you like to chat about? And sometimes it's a disguised sales pitch. So mm -hmm. they're like, oh, I just want to learn about you and your story. I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. So I think networking is about helping, like meeting people where they're at and, and it's a give and take. Like, can I help somebody? Can, can, can they help me potentially? And just selfishly, it's filling up my novelty bucket. So in the book, I don't know if you've, you've read this part, but our brains are like a universe full of stars and planets and ast astronauts or whatever. Every experience, every interaction, every 
relationship you have adds another star in your universe. And if you want to be creative, if you don't have very many stars, your little rocket ship that's trying to figure out that you can't feel it's happening in the default mode network, it's trying to connect different experiences into an amazing aha. If you don't have very many stars, you'll have really boring and not interesting ideas. So if you take the opportunity to network and meet people who might seem completely random and, and um, not even important to what your goals are, that person could give you a star in your universe that could result in an amazing aha or an amazing change for you in the future. So I think when, when I talk about networking, I think there's a balance. There's a balance of meeting people and how can you help the world? If I have a young veterinarian reach out to me that wants to chat about you know, their career, like, absolutely, I'll make time for that. If it's someone that's like an insurance salesman, that's like, hey, I just want to learn about your story. Like, I'm not, I'm sorry. Like, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've learned about networking is don't prejudge people too much, but also protect your time. Mm -hmm. and go in with an open mind, but with a clear agenda. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I uh, struggle with is having that clear agenda, like what is my hope outcome from this meeting? And I think one of the things I'm getting better at is saying, okay, when I'm like, when we spoke, what was my, what was my uh, hopeful outcome from when we chatted a month ago? It was really just to learn more about you and learn about your perspective on veterinary medicine and be open to what could happen. Mm -hmm. So I think that long, long, long answer to your very short question is find a balance between um, finding people who you specifically want to talk to for specific reasons and staying open to just finding out what could happen. Step off that diving board and be yeah. like, you know, what, what is this person going to give me that um, or what can I give them that could just make the world a better place? And you don't know sometimes until you engage with that person. You, you don't, you don't. I've, I've always been somebody who is very curious about humans. Like curiosity is like the best skill set I think you can have is just to be curious and, and ask good questions. And people are fascinating to me. So mm -hmm. I do like to reach out to people. And sometimes it's amazing who will answer you back. It, it, and you just don't know until you ask. So I've had some fascinating conversations. I just gave a talk not too long ago at the AHA conference. And it was about how to talk to strangers because we're <laughs> You know, we have raised a whole generation of people whose mothers said, oh, stranger danger, you're going to get kidnapped off the street. When the reality is 79 people got kidnapped by strangers in the United States in the last like umpteen years. Yeah. And not to say that's that's not horrific, but the truth of the matter is it's so rare that you should be able to talk to strangers and have a good conversation because it releases endorphins in your brain. Even if somebody asks you to reach for a box of rice on the shelf in the grocery store, it makes you happy. And we need to understand that and start to, uh, because we're, we are tribal. You mentioned the fact that we don't want to get kicked out of the tribe, but we also can increase our tribe. And, and I think I love the analogy of having stars in your universe, because you really don't know, you know, what you, what you're going to find out that somebody knows that will be so helpful to you in the future or that share a piece of information that may change everything about their perspective. And for me, I love to talk to startup companies and that are starting technology because I've been in the practice so long. And I, I remember starting with, uh, there, was a, there was a company called Policy and it helps veterinarians share in, insurance information with clients. And it can be automated, but they were going, oh, well, your receptionist has to do this and your practice owner has to do that. But no, no, there is no time for any of this. And you've got to completely revamp how you're going to do this. And they did. And so it, now we have a really seamless thing that kind of in the background reaches out to clients and says, does your pet have pet insurance? And if not, would you like to you know, get a quote? And yeah, that's the way we do it. Don't put any more on us than we already have, but God help us, you know, any way you can. So those are, those are great things. Well, you know what I have to say, I love that you brought up curiosity because in my book, I use the, the framework of dance, which is the five habits to engage creativity. And the C is for curiosity, because if you're not curious, then you can't wonder how things could be different. Mm -hmm. And curiosity is something you can work on in practice and facing the ambiguity of speaking to a stranger and not knowing how they're going to react is 
excellent exercise for when you aren't sure how to proceed in a medical case. So I love those two points you brought up are both instrumental to creativity, which is curiosity and facing ambiguity. And, you know, you can do it. You just have to take the time and we don't give ourselves, speaking of busyness, we don't give ourselves enough time. We can't expect to have creative solutions or to have good well-being if we're not giving ourselves the time to allow those systems to percolate percolate so um so i love that i love that you're curious yeah yes this is sometimes it probably leads me down a rabbit hole but that's okay because then you just never know it's it's still back here mm -hmm. and at one day i'll need to pull it up to the front and uh, and utilize it in some way shape or form it's a star in your universe. It's a star in my universe. I can't, and now I can't wait to get to that section. So I will <laughs> have to start. start I can't remember period. what section that is. I think it might be novelty and so. Okay. All right. Well, now something to look forward to even more in this book. All right. So to wind up, do you have any final words of wisdom? Um, anything you would like to say? A book that you would like to shout out and say, this is this is the one that you should read? Well, obviously my book, which is on Amazon, <laughs> yes. but, um, you know, I'm a really big fan of care. If you're looking to put more creativity into your day, aside from my book, there's um, an author called Carrie Smith. I just have her book handy right here. And she has a number of books that are very interactive. It's very <laughs> much like one of them's called wreck this journal. And she's like, rip the page out of this book. You, you got to do it. So it's about facing that ambiguity and um, doing exercises. So I love anything by her Carrie Smith, K E R I. Okay. And uh, I love uh, Dan Pink's new book, The Power of Regret is excellent because it also helps you to um, harness regret as, you know, maybe you regretted doing something in your career or life, but it's a really interesting way at how, look at how regret propels us forward as well as pushing us towards what we want in our life. So those would be two books off the top of my head. Yeah, excellent. I have so well, many I, books. I could, I could talk for an hour and a half about oh, the book. I if I didn't have this screensaver behind me, you would see two bookshelves six feet tall full of books because I am a book junkie and the day that they came out with nooks and kindles and you could put 2,000 books on one I'm like oh, I've got to have one of these and I actually have two uh, but I do want to again talk about and, and tell people to please read The Reluctant Creative. This is such a fun book that that Carolyn wrote. I'm just trying the camera keeps zooming in out. Let me put it here. Um, I'm like, yeah. Know. Okay. Yeah. Well, yours is showing backwards, so I'm going to show mine. Oh, is it? Forward. Yeah, it is showing backwards. So, you know what? I was trying to figure that. When I look at it, it's showing forward. It's showing forwards. Well, maybe it's mine showing forwards to you. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. I think maybe it's mine. I must have to change the settings. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe uh, mirrored your mirrored your camera. I don't know. Well, I, well, we're yeah. discovering creative things now. <laughs> we're stepping into the uncertainty. Stepping into the uncertainty. You think failure. Yeah. <laughs> But the, the cool part about this book, too, is there are exercises in here. And I think this is important. Like you said, interactive, stretch those muscles. You know, if you're not somebody who naturally goes to creative things um, and thinks that you can't do that, I think having a place in the book that says, now go do this and practice it is a really wonderful tool. And I enjoy that. Uh, I can tell you I've not done anything, but but then again, on my own, I kind of do that stuff anyway, because that's the way I roll. But um, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for writing this book. I, I think you're bringing something to light that definitely needs to have, a, a, it needs to shine on in our profession, because we are, you know, these scientific thinkers, but highly empathetic, and we need to pull out that creative part of us um, so that we have a good balance so that our brain gets that exercise on both sides of the line and we can enjoy our work more when we figure out that problem solving is fun and perfection is not necessary sometimes good is just good enough Oh, thank you, Debbie. It's such a pleasure to be on your podcast and enjoyed our conversation thoroughly and agree with you wholeheartedly, both for the individual, but also if we're going to solve the problems together in veterinary medicine, we need creativity and you can't just, you know, you need to have support and a framework and um, time to do that. And I'm so glad to hear that you're helping push that along and helping people find better tools to work better every day. Every day, we all just have to work toward the goal. Yeah. I, I do have one last thing to say. Yes. Creativity is like poop. You're full of it. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's <laughs> hope. That is true. That is true. All right. Well, thank you again so much. It's been a pleasure. And um, I think we could probably talk about this for hours and hours, but we both have 
other things that we've got to get to. So I look forward to connecting with you again in the future and the audience. We will have all your information about the book, your uh, speaking engagements, even your comedy show um, <laughs> uh, in the show notes so that people can reach out to you and take advantage of this, this light that you shine in the world of vet med. So thank you again so much for your time today. Thanks, Debbie.